almost the last but one session. So we are almost getting closer to the finish of the conference. But as our tradition for the CHPC conference, at this time, um, that's when we want to hear about what's coming, what's new. And no one else uh, is given this slot except um, the esteemed Professor Thomas Delling. Uh, he will be talking to you about the pivot of HPC towards memory-centric computers uh, for AI. I, I, I don't know what is that, so Thomas will tell you all about it, but uh, I'm really looking forward to listen to this. Um, uh, Professor Stelling's uh, uh, bio is there in um, the program. Uh, all what I can tell you is that uh, he's the professor at uh, Indiana University. And one of the main things that um, he has done was to democratize HPC through uh, the Buell cluster uh, okay. that today made it possible for us to uh, go from supercomputers and go into happiness computing. Professor Sterling keeps on working in that and hence today now he's moving from compute centric and talking about memory centric and mainly because he wants to bring in things like artificial intelligence. So we're really looking forward to listen to Professor Sterling. And um, with those words, um, Thomas, over to you. Happy, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I regret that I cannot see all of you on the other side of the screen, uh, but I'm delighted to have you uh, in attendance. And uh, I hope uh, that my comments uh, will prove as a uh, uh, good way to bring this uh, important conference to the end. My congratulations, of course, to Happy, uh, to Werner, and to the many others engaged in the program uh, technical committee and um, uh, managing, in spite of all of the challenges the world is facing, uh, to have a, a, a very successful uh, forum moving the field uh, forward in the international community. Now, if you'll allow me, I have to figure out how to show you, there we go, my slides. Uh, All right. Yeah, we can see the slots. You can or cannot? We can see them. Okay, but I can't. Uh, well, uh, I'm a little confused. Just a second, one last button to push. Excellent. It's on All right, thank you very much. Um, I, let, me, let me preface my uh, formal comment uh, with a few observations about this talk. Uh, uh, first, of course, it is an honor uh, to close uh, or penultimately close uh, th this year the CHPC 21 conference. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. Uh, it, it is truly a privilege to do so. I've never given this presentation before. There's not a single slide that I have ever shown before. Um, this is going to be a very different talk. There are no images. Well. There's one image at the very end. It is stark, it is bleak, it is dense. Uh, and uh, for me personally, it may be the most important presentation I've ever given. The conclusions I will convey, and I say this uh, in particular directly to the students in the audience, uh, they are provocative uh, in laying out a different than industrial or user-based community would project uh, towards uh, the end of this decade and they're controversial. The, the vast majority of the mainstream for good and practical reasons would disagree. However, uh, uh, as I was telling uh, Happy and Werner just moments ago, uh, the topics of this uh, presentation are in fact uh, uh, captured closely uh, by a new uh, a program just being released uh, within the uh, US federal government for a three year research uh, activity to explore uh, many ideas to which the topics I will present are closely related. So it is not a random or arbitrary uh, presentation. 
Now, uh, uh, usually you're told, uh, again to the students, tell them what you're going to say, tell them, and then tell them what you said. Eh, we don't have enough time for that, but let me tell you what I really want to focus on. And that is that we at this moment are at a singularity, a specific point in time, okay, a sloppy time point, but nonetheless, over a very small number of years, in which essentially everything is changing and it's changing because the underlying enabling technologies have changed to a critical nonlinear point. Yes, of course, I'm referring to the end of Moore's law, but also other changes such as new emergent processor core designs, which in fact you're already familiar with, but which go beyond or outside the scope of uh, the x86 family that's been so successful over many decades. Uh, we will be talking about a class of computing that is, is even beyond conventional heterogeneous execution. You are in all likelihood used to the idea uh, of using not only uh, multi-core, many-core uh, chips in a shared memory framework with uh, uh, a separation of uh, nodes uh, via message passing, but you're familiar with the insertion or the interoperability of uh, GPUs and other forms of accelerators, uh, a variation uh, uh, of which uh, is even in the world's fastest computer, which is Fugaku uh, in Kobe, Japan, uh, done by Fujitsu. Uh, we will conclude by the importance of this also being driven uh, by uh, the, the explosion, there's no other way to describe it, uh, the explosion of applications in the broad area of data science by what is perhaps uh, referred to as machine learning or deep learning, and more specifically supervised uh, learning of both of those uh, for, for an unbounded number of real world applications uh, to find uh, new ways to do uh, analysis. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, but the far beyond that is the resurgence of artificial intelligence, to use an old term, uh, and even beyond that, uh, machine intelligence that uh, uh, will pick up and be, uh, will have become the most important source of computation uh, and algorithms, in my opinion. Uh, and finally, I will close uh, by discussing uh, a, a particular class of architecture. In the broader sense, it's referred to by the community as memory-centric, uh, but uh, uh, more narrowly, we refer to this as a, an active memory architecture. And, and I'll briefly explain what that means. And then I'll show you a picture. All right, so it would be good to frame uh, this presentation, this talk, in, uh, uh, within the scope, within the dimensions of the classical uh, seven decade history of uh, high performance computing. Many of you have seen one form or another by many deliverers uh, of that history. I have certainly crafted more than one uh, a discussion, description indeed in our textbook uh, that uh, of which we are writing a second edition to be published next spring uh, uh, entitled Unimaginatively High Performance Computing. Uh, I ha we also have an entire chapter now dedicated uh, to this, but it's not the history, what we did on our summer vacations. It is uh, the large implications for the total field across its total time. And I would say the uh, driving uh, considerations are the following. Technology, enabling technology has driven the evolution of high performance computing. In the, uh, on this slide, you see uh, uh, that, uh, uh, and I didn't mean to, do it this way, it just came this way uh, as I was doing it. Uh, on a decade cadence, uh, we find steps in uh, technology. Vacuum tubes, uh, even when I was uh, a child, uh, vacuum tube computers were uh, the principal source. Uh, after that, uh, uh, the transistor developed in 1947 uh, became the uh, technology franca uh, for that. Uh, yet again, 10 years later, the small scale and medium scale integration uh, gave us some of the uh, fa gave us the fastest computers in the world. And this succeeded to what unimaginatively was referred to large scale integration, and then finally, very large scale. Well, in fact, VLSI kind of stagnated, but very 
got varied dramatically over orders of magnitude and ultimately burst, it seems, uh, to the point where we had multi-core and then many core uh, processing uh, on individual uh, integrated circuits on chips. Uh, in the previous decade, uh, the heterogeneous computing, which had always been in the background going as far back as the 70s, at least as far as I can, I can determine, uh, nonetheless uh, became this important augmentation, at least for certain classes of applications. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, we are in this decade. And what would you say we are? Well, um, it's not obvious. Uh, I think uh, it is the age of domain-specific accelerators. Uh, yes, obviously, with long tails going back to the previous couple of decades, but, but more importantly, recognizing that full systems uh, focused on key application domains, mostly in this case, machine learning, uh, uh, has uh, uh, taken great strides and has become a focus, if not the focus, of advances in high performance computing. I've provided a set of examples for each of those. Uh, I have to apologize. I may have been a little sloppy with the exact years. I got most of them right, a couple of them uh, not. I'd like to point out that uh, in the very first decade, uh, even then, two of these very um, uh, inchoate computers provided the division between data processing on the one hand and high-speed numeric or supercomputing on the other. UNIVAC uh, was a data processor trying to manage the largest uh, user data it could at that time with that technology. And Whirlwind was the premier uh, for a very small number of years, well, you know, like two or three, uh, the fastest computer in the world and had enormous impact. Both of them did. Uh, I'd love to spend a whole talk about Whirlwind. I'd like to point out the mini computer was invented in the next uh, decade, uh, that the uh, uh, first um, one mega flops computer that same decade, uh, that was the introduction, by the way, of silicon as opposed to germanium transistors at CDC. And then, of course, the preeminent Cray-1 computer in the following decade, which blew everything else out of the water and uh, some believe actually defined what a supercomputer is. In fact, they, they miss it. But if you go a couple of um, uh, decades ahead, I'm going to wave my own flag here. And in 1985 to 1995, you had the emergence of clusters in general. And then uh, my small contribution in the area of Beowulf commodity clusters, which also uh, brought in Linux. This is where Happy very kindly referred to the democratization of high performance computing. And I think you know the rest of it. Uh, there were also these milestones of gigaflops, teraflops, petaflops, and we're looking quite possibly in this year, before I see you next year, uh, we're looking at hitting one exaflops Limpac RMAC. Very exciting time, even if I have to talk to you from my office uh, in Indiana. Um, now, <clears throat> I've never done this before, so I ask you to be my friends and be a little bit tolerant. I would like to tell you, describe to you, in a career that has spanned more than four decades, and fortunately, I'm very grateful for the opportunity, all in the area or the domain of high performance computing, parallel computing, from its beginning in the late 1970s when I started as a graduate student at MIT to this very moment where I'm having the honor to present to you. Um, I have uh, had a number of different experiences from which I have garnered, gleaned, or at least been bludgeoned by unexpected lessons learned. And this is not simply a recap or a, a, a look back on all the old years. The consequences, those lessons are, in my mind, now at a time of singularity, the lessons that allow us to drive forward in a revolutionary way. And I don't use that term uh, loosely. So I won't explain what I'm about to do. So I'm just going to run through this. You have the slides accessible. Uh, this is not about me. This is about the uh, strong influence of the real world and uh, future abstractions uh, which are derived from this. So I, I started out uh, uh, at MIT 
in of all places, the Power Lab, which gave me the opportunity to do my first experiment with uh, parallel computing and specifically multiprocessing or multiple processing in which I built a, a small multiprocessor uh, that was uh, intended to design to uh, uh, support simulation of power electronic circuits uh, and with a complicated, uh, more complicated than usual model uh, that was not just linear, but piecewise linear. So there were nonlinearities uh, that caused uh, changes in the actual uh, formulation of the problem as, as uh, we went forward. Um, the, uh, uh, so we built a little machine out of um, uh, microprocessors. These were Z8000s. And so I, this was my first hands-on exposure as I also did some paper studies about the potential of parallel computing. Still within the same uh, environment, that is to say MIT, although now transferring to the Laboratory for Computer Science, I worked on uh, uh, a project called CONCERT, uh, developed at the Laboratory com um, uh, of, of uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the uh, Laboratory of Computer Science there, um, and uh, worked on hands-on uh, on a multiprocessor, originally 32 processes, which was much more than my previous project, and would, in fact, in my postgraduate work, continue uh, in industry on yet another system, Concert 2, that was twice as large and four times as fast as the original Concert at the same time. And, and students, this is underlined. Uh, this is where I uh, experienced for the first time the importance of abstraction, and particularly abstraction in execution models. Moving forward, I had the opportunity to work within the framework of uh, important government computation. I'm being intentionally obscure here uh, because, frankly, this was classified work, uh, in which I, I uh, was able uh, to uh, work in the area of symbolic computing which is a precursor and underpinnings of artificial intelligence in the more classical sense rather than the, the current machine learning. Uh, and at the same time, to study in greater detail uh, fine-grained processing based on but not limited to a model of, of data flow. Moving forward, I had the, the fantastic opportunity, timing was perfect, to join the uh, uh, first major uh, U.S. National Program on High Performance Computing, which was the whole of government, that's a phrase meaning multi-agency, uh, in which the uh, government was committed to understanding and advancing uh, the field of high performance computing, jump-starting this field. And I joined NASA ultimately for a career of 14 years at NASA, even while I had my other foot in academia. And I'll say more about that. Within that uh, uh, program, uh, through um, uh, fortuitous and completely serendipitous uh, reasons, uh, I, had, I had the opportunity to start and to manage the uh, uh, Beowulf uh, Commodity Cluster uh, project, which, among other things, introduced uh, an inchoate Linux uh, to the field of high performance computing. Uh, even modesty demands that I state that that was essentially revolutionary and had enormous impact on uh, the field of high performance computing and in fact dominates uh, to this day. I take no credit for that. Uh, it was timing, it was placing, it was requirements, it was the availability of funding. It was very bright people working with me on this and who would have thought it? Uh, but it showed a number of important things, including uh, the breakthrough importance of performance to cost. And during that time, I, at the same time, ran a second program, completely unrelated to the Beowulf, if anything, the um, uh, exact opposite. Uh, this was called HTMT. I didn't want to run it. HTMT stands for um, Hybrid Technology Multi-Threaded. Uh, architecture. It was only supposed to be six months and cost $100,000. It turned out to be four years and cost several million dollars. Uh, and it was all aimed at understanding the uh, um, potential importance and the consequences, the dramatic implications of exploiting advanced technologies like, but not limited, to uh, cryogenic logic, 
uh, superconducting supercomputing, and uh, holographic storage and other technologies as well. I almost decide that there is, is the end of the first phase of my uh, uh, career, uh, spanning a period of some 27 years in which I had the experiences that drove me to start to reconsider how supercomputing uh, should, could or should be done. And the second phase, right up until, well, today, right now, you are there, uh, allowed the journey to continue. Uh, but um, I, I, professionally, I switched from being a research scientist in various kinds of government uh, laboratories and uh, universities uh, to becoming f a full professor. And so I served uh, for a period of almost 17 years now as a full professor, first at Louisiana State Un uh, University. I'm very grateful to them for that opportunity and currently at the Indiana uh, University uh, also with great pride. And uh, the subjects of this were the consequences. What did it mean to have encountered and dealt with many of these challenges, including uh, the variation and the nonlinearity of technology evolution? Uh, and um, uh, I had, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, I had concluded that work needed to be done in the uh, somewhat arcane and frankly not widely appreciated area of execution models. An abstraction. I'll repeat this a couple of times. Students, this is a student alert. The power of abstraction. Power of abstraction, I'm giving you a, a foreshadowing. The power of abstraction allows you essentially to deal with an infinite number of design points in finite time, in finite resources. Uh, and, and by doing so, uh, we're able to explore vast array of differences without having to simulate every single one of the infinite points, right? So uh, let me just tell you, that isn't possible, right? And one of the consequences, as you'll see, is that I became, um, uh, I came to recognize the importance of runtime systems, not new in the sense of invention, but in this application, uh, there are uh, several, you know, at least half a dozen, if not a few more, runtime systems, both within the US and internationally, uh, that gave an extra dimension to control and capability, efficiency and scalability. Uh, and I did two iterations of that. The first one was at Louisiana State University, uh, devising uh, the uh, skeleton, the outline, the first prototype, first reduction to practice of the HPX runtime system, which continues to this day under other leadership and my congratulations uh, to Hartmut Kaiser. Uh, of Louisiana State Union and, and the entire community, uh, both within the US and Europe uh, as, as well uh, on that. Then at uh, Indiana University, having learned many lessons, I did it again. And uh, that was coming up with a more rigorous uh, formal model of the parallax execution model that uh, allowed for uh, a real analysis uh, both in functionality and performance, and then a new performance-oriented runtime system, HPX5. In the last three or four years, I have now taken all of that and focused on uh, my current project, which are uh, a non-von Neumann architecture that we will discuss at the end of this talk, the active memory architecture, and um, uh, the um, uh, gra graph processing uh, for um, uh, dynamic and irregular, irregular processes that uh, bring us uh, to artificial intelligence. So that's my history. I didn't want to make it as long as that, but I want you to give a sense of the number of different kinds of activities and engagements, research and development that I was exposed to in order to come to the, the next three and most important slides, which are the lessons learned. I don't have enough time to discuss each one in detail. So consider each one a title of what should be an entire talk. Uh, and some of these won't surprise you at all. They're obvious. Uh, the uh, first, of course, the first experience was that you could do performance brain through uh, parallel computing and specifically, uh, and this was just after the Cray one was developed. So it's very early in the stage uh, with multi microprocessors. Uh, but also in concert with co-design. Uh, I expanded on that to a scaling 
of parallel computing uh, and at the same time the imperative of parallel execution models. You actually use an execution model. You use a communicating sequential processing model. Sometimes you refer to it as message passing or a variant, the bulk synchronous parallel. Some of you use a shared memory model, uh, most likely in the form of OpenMP, the first one being MPI, both very successful. Um, but a new execution model is needed to handle the very different technologies than these first models were created. Uh, Hands-on and in, in, in running, uh, uh, I uh, had the opportunity to develop uh, with colleagues a uh, first compiler for a fork join uh, parallel uh, uh, programming and execution model. Uh, we called it simultaneous Pascal. Uh, maybe none of you have seen Pascal. It's a, a language that was all the rage and then has really gone off the face of the map. Uh, but you're familiar with the semantics in a much better implementation, OpenMP. Uh, I had a chance to work not just in numeric processing, uh, but I learned about symbolic computing. Symbolic computing being the log uh, logic of, um, excuse me, I'm, I'm uh, looking at this clock and I was worried. I, I wasn't sure where I was in the time. And then I just realized it's counting backwards. Um, so um, uh, I, that means I have more time than I thought I did. Uh, the um, uh, use of symbolic computing, as you will see, is central. Well, let me just jump right ahead to making machines intelligent. This is not a new idea. We'll discuss it shortly. Uh, but it is a, revolutionary is an understatement. And uh, I also at that time be, uh, was able to understand some of the implementations of those programs. In those days, I was using such programming languages, Lisp, um, the, no longer uh, a widely used language, but the semantics you'll find in most cases are actually in different form found in Python. Uh, so it hasn't been uh, lost. Now, uh, <laughs> I, I tell you this only because it's actually important, but it has nothing to do with the actual technologies of the ideas of high performance computing. I took that year off, remember, and I spent one year downtown Washington, D.C. at NASA headquarters. And I have to say, it was the single most painful year of my entire career. It was, well, all I can say is it was, it was painful including the longest uh, commute I ever had to suffer, about 50 minutes from um, uh, near Annapolis to uh, downtown Washington. I learned an enormous amount of value. So again, to the students, having opportunities to work as an intern in industry or within government can tell you how the real world works and will make you very, very effective. I also learned the value of open source software as we were uh, uh, playing with uh, Beowulf. Uh, we didn't invent open source. Uh, we didn't invent Linux. That was a graduate student in Finland. But we did make it practical, especially through the network communication. Uh, credit goes to Donald Becker uh, and others for this uh, great accomplishment. And we learned that there is a role, not in opposition to, but in synergy with proprietary products uh, within uh, industry for independent software vendors stability and for end user applications against stability, allowing long-term software to rely on short-term hardware. Uh, this uh, in part was enabled by a commonality provided by many pieces of open source software serving as well as empowering uh, proprietary software. Very important lesson. Uh, I, I don't have to go into how important for me personally was the experience of the Beowulf project. Uh, many at the quantitative level about the properties that added to the performance gain, but also inhibited or subtracted from the performance. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, it was uh, it, it was a, a really uh, tremendous experience. Um, uh, even uh, uh, wrote a book, uh, well, wrote more than one book, but How to Build the Beowulf, 
was uh, a, an interesting experience. Um, it, it, it really went hot for a few weeks on Amazon's book list back then. Um, but, but it also showed that uh, the uh, notion of a system where different elements come together, integrated, interoperate, to work towards a common or shared end is the important and real perspective. Uh, we, our, our timing was fantastic as well. Now, let, let me mention uh, in summary the notion of slower. I have in fact talked about this at uh, prior uh, uh, CHPC meetings uh, with pleasure. So I'll just summarize it here. I suggest to you, perhaps incomplete, but I think uh, with very good coverage, that there are six dimensions that all computers can be analyzed by quantitatively to understand their effectiveness or efficiency and their scalability and how to improve both. Now, it must have been a dark day when I, I uh, finally put this together because all of these dimensions are negatives. They're bad things that you want to fix rather than smiley face good things that you want to do. Um, and uh, that's why the, the, <laughs> the acronym SLOWER uh, ultimately became adopted. Let me just quickly touch on these. Starvation is when you don't have enough work to uh, take best advantage of the resources you have. Starvation means not enough work. What's the opposite of that? Parallelism availability. The second is latency. Latency is unbelievably important. It is, of course, the time uh, for uh, potentially some access either of information from some other part of a machine or for a service of some other part of the machine. And instead of being a few nanoseconds, uh, these can be microseconds, uh, tens of microseconds in, in bad cases. But for me, the worst one is overhead. Overhead is that work which you don't want to do. It's not work that part of your algorithm, it's work that manages the parallelism in your algorithm, the parallelism in your system. And you need to make that as small as possible, not just to get rid of the efficiency, inefficiencies of the overhead itself, but in fact, because there's a secondary effect, putting a bound on the uh, granularity of parallelism that you can exploit. How small can you make that parallelism and still be effective and therefore increase the concurrency and, and as a result increase the speed throughput and also most importantly time to solution, reduce the time to solution. There is additionally uh, what here we refer to as contention because we needed to make the acronym work. We say waiting for resolution of contention that is clearly an ar artifact of struggling with uh, an acronym. Uh, but uh, you, you're more familiar with contention as uh, network bandwidth or, or uh, memory, uh, memory access uh, throughput. And those are forms of contention, but there are many others, including contention for a global barrier. The last two, a little bit different, uh, but they both have the same units, which comes down to time or inverse of time, and that is energy. Uh, energy is an expense, surely. It is an upper bound of capability, surely. There's only so much uh, power you can put into a chip, let's say less than 200 watts, but you'd really, really like that to be less than 10 watts if possible. Um, but it also determines clock rate, the rate at which the, well, uh, instructions are fed into the, into the machine. So uh, energy and power have a, a double impact on uh, the ability to expand, increase the performance throughput. Uh, of computers and reduce the operational costs. And finally, uh, the R stands for liability or resilience, but in the end, it's manifest as um, uh, time. Uh, that is to say, ultimately the utilization time, how much of the lifetime of a machine is actually used for real work. And so you, that's a utility function. Uh, used in other forms of analysis not related to computing, and it applies here also. Um, uh, in our case, uh, it allows us to devise machines that even when they break, don't stop operating. They continue to operate, but in a degraded fashion. 
So you have a computer that has slightly less, increase, increasingly less, okay, that's an oxymoron, but a, a reduction in the total amount of working resources. We call that a depleted architecture. Uh, and if there's very, by, very high repetition or redundancy, you're able to exploit this because of the uniformity and, uh, as I say, replication. And, and uh, while I will not discuss that in detail, I will allude to it as one of the important capabilities facing us over this decade in front of us. All right, I took too much time on that, but it was important. I certainly think students need to understand those dimensions. Uh, as I said, um, a number of my points are provocative and in some sense controversial. I think this is provocative and, and the pushback you'll get is either that's silly or that's obvious. As long as you learn it, I don't care. The parallax execution model is a manifestation of the lessons I've learned about the, in air quotes, please pay attention, power of abstraction. If that's all you learn, um, plus my name, if that's all you learn, uh, please, uh, that, that should be it. The power of abstraction uh, allows you to manipulate at a strategic level, not at incremental tactical levels, uh, the whole vast array of alternatives in uh, devising means methodologies of computing. Now, there are uh, examples of what are actually incorporated in the parallax execution model. I, I list here, uh, but in, the important thing is that parallax execution model enables two properties, two properties. One, the use and exploitation, not of conventional or historical von Neumann architectures and their derivatives, which have been brilliantly successful over the last six or seven decades, but have run out of steam, but rather alternatives in what would be referred to as non von Neumann architectures. And in my personal case, and that of my team, my research team, uh, that um, uh, would be in the area of memory focused or memory centric architectures. I'll come back to that. Instead of message passing with which any of you with mem uh, MPI are familiar, message driven computation. Message driven computation moves the work to the data, not just always demands that the, uh, 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 um, okay, I blew that. Yeah, no, moves the work to the data rather than always having to drag the data to the work. Now, that may seem like a, just a twist of words, but it completely changes. For example, it could cut the latency in half immediately, uh, but it also allows the management of uh, asynchrony. Um, the center uh, piece of control flow is a futures construct. Futures construct developed in the late 1970s uh, in the actors model. I bet you're not taught that, are you? Um, uh, uh, gives a much more powerful, a much richer semantics, and therefore a much highly, more highly uh, efficient uh, form of uh, synchronization and eliminates uh, the need for global barriers, which can be highly inefficient, although in certain regular problems is particularly fine. Uh, the rest you can, you can read. And the other thing here, um, in addition to enabling the use of non von Neumann architectures and exploring the, those design spaces, uh, enables the efficient ability, the effective ability uh, to use runtime system strategies, not just compile time strategies, so that you can exploit information in real time about both the application, parallel application, and the state of the parallel resources to make just in time decisions about the operation of the system. And for some classes of applications, this is really big. When the application flow is de data dependent, is determined by the intermediate values uh, of the computation, uh, this is when a runtime system can have a profound effect on improving the, uh, the uh, effectiveness, the efficiency and the scalability of computing. And uh, that, that lesson came home hard to me. It also provides, yes, that word again, it provides an abstraction or rather an interface or exports an abstraction uh, that is richer than the exact hardware or that the compiler can provide uh, initially. 
Now, th this is the last of the three slides, and it's all about this class of architecture uh, that I find very exciting. It's sometimes easy to get excited, especially about, well, I find myself currently exploring had some history in prior art. And when I say prior, I sometimes mean three to four decades. I don't have time to give credit, but I want to make it make it clear uh, to uh, my colleagues uh, in the audience and to the students that uh, even when there are many ideas that are uh, have already been examined, those examinations, those explorations, those investigations were done in a very different technology context. And the conclusions drawn at that time uh, sometimes are intellectually very stimulating, but as they were implemented in their initial manifestation, they're not, uh, they were not effective. Now, in many cases, and in a very different synthesis, in, in, almost synergistically, uh, they are again coming together uh, to provide, I, I, I hate to use the word, but there's no other way to put it, a revolutionary strategy for the future of computing. Wish I could uh, spend uh, a big talk on just this one bullet, non von Neumann architecture. Uh, let me just touch on a couple of sub bullets. The key idea here is that von Neumann architecture wildly successful, the foundation of a probably over time a trillion dollar industry. Nonetheless, the von Neumann architecture is not just obsolete, but is woefully obsolete to the point of transgression. Maintaining the semantic implication of the von Neumann architecture, which is overly constrained Maintaining that actually costs us enormously. And our analysis shows, and I suspect that of others as well, and there are examples even in uh, startup companies and in such, some of the largest computing companies in the world, there is a recognition that if you release yourself, you free, you liberate the industry from these underlying and often unacknowledged uh, uh, assumptions, uh, you have probably about two orders of magnitude to play with in terms of efficiency of space. So let me just give you a couple you can read the later uh, at your leisure. Um, we have historically um, uh, ampl uh, acknowledged and amplified the importance of efficiency defined as the ratio of sustained floating point performance to peak floating point performance. A variation of that is the um, uh, HPL or lin parallel LINPAC benchmark, extraordinarily effective in providing a historical database of more than two dozen years. Don't ever stop that. But as uh, most will acknowledge, it's a friendly benchmark. It's one the vendors love because it uh, scales in a way that hides their limitations, their weaknesses. The, the, the objective function, the goal of maximizing the utilization of a floating point unit is an historic legacy of the von Neumann model and no longer applies because once the floating point unit might have been the most expensive part of the computer, today it is close to the least expensive part. You would rather provide high availability than high utilization. Yet it's hard for us to get out from that. Just uh, um, a few weeks ago at uh, Supercomputing, yet again, the, the, the most recent half year of the uh, top 500 list, which is a measure of exactly this property, uh, uh, re, re um, uh, uh, anointed uh, the Fugaku architecture as a, um, in Japan as uh, the world's fastest computer uh, in that. Now, in fact, uh, let me just say, uh, Satoshi Matsuoko might see this, um, uh, uh, Fugaku is much more than a floating point machine. In fact, if it's anything, it is uh, a remarkable uh, architecture uh, in part by Fujitsu using ARM, uh, variation of ARM, uh, in uh, other forms of computation, including, but not limited to graph processing, uh, I think it's the number one machine in uh, the breadth first search or graph 500. 
Uh, another uh, and the second aspect of uh, the von no the, uh, of the von Neumann architecture is this this separation of the main memory from the the logic, the processing logic. Now that was essential. Excuse me, I just like to make an adjustment here. Um, that was essential because of the disparity of the original enabling technologies, <laughs> vacuum tube through logic and uh, 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 core memory, little little tiny magnetic toroidal things for bits. Uh, you, when I was uh, in the age of the youngest students in uh, the audience, um, I could actually see a bit. <laughs> Think about that. Now you need an electron microscope to see a bit. This separation is even often referred to in one variation or another as the, as the von Neumann bottleneck. Since today, uh, both memory and um, logic are made with essentially the same technologies, although slightly different fabrication processes, that bottleneck is an artifact uh, of um, uh, past uh, legacies, not a requirement. Now that's just two. Uh, there are another four such issues. Uh, so. Um, uh, the take home from that is von Neumann architecture, wonderful history, tremendous impact. We need to retire it. If we're going to jump two orders of magnitude at a time when technology in itself is no longer going to allow us to do exponential growth because we're reaching uh, the uh, one nanometer uh, boundary and you know atoms are only one tenth or more angstroms uh, and those are small atoms. Uh, we um, uh, really need to move into another conceptual and physical uh, domain for computation structures. The uh, second lesson is that, uh, in following on that, it's not the logic that's important, it is the data. The data and the hardware that supports the data moves the data uh, as well as, uh, well, and, and that orders or structures the data logically requires not a processor-centric architecture, which is most of what we have today, but rather a memory-centric architecture that recognizes that, you know, frankly, most of the time the memory is between a quarter and half the cost of a computer. Uh, when I was the age of um, uh, you graduate students, I, it was uh, that uh, we expected that there would be one byte of main memory for every one flops, and the S stands for seconds, not plural, floating point operations per second uh, of performance. And today it's only 1% of that. Now, there are actually good reasons if you look at application patterns uh, for that, but it's a very different space. Memory is the big requirement here. And you say, what about communications? Yes, I agree. Um, but uh, uh, so memory centric architectures should be the basis of our new perspectives, our new visions looking forward, and our, our new designs as well for implementations. Um, I discuss here uh, in uh, uh, almost half a dozen bullets, uh, different aspects of uh, a class of architecture uh, might as well just tell you, it, we call it the, the, as I have said, an active memory architecture. Say more about that in a moment. And this is where processors are not big, they are tiny, they are minuscule. If you think an ARM is small, this is smaller. If you think a RISC-V is going to be small, this is smaller. If you think an embedded processor in your flashlight or toaster is small, this is smaller. Uh, in fact, uh, it would, uh, our analysis shows that in a modest size chip in the teens, uh, in um, uh, 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 sorry, uh, millimeters on a side, uh, we expect there to be between 10 and 25,000 such processors. I call them processors, we shouldn't. The real term we should use is a compute cell. A compute cell, while probably someone would prove, is Turing equivalent. In a practical sense, it is not capable of alone running an application. It is, in fact, another way to look at it as very modest memory banks. Those memory banks are main memory. Those memory banks are SRAM, not DRAM, with a proliferation of ALUs 
where the ALUs, we don't care about how efficiently they are used. We care about how efficiently the memory to which they are attached are used. So it is availability, not utilization, that supports the uh, ALU. Very different design uh, optimization uh, concept. In this uh, memory-centric architecture, there are a number of almost blasphemies that are committed. Ready? Stand by. No caches, at least in the conventional sense. No cache coherence in the conventional sense. Uh, yes, tags. Tags for synchronization, tags for data typing, tags for flow control. Uh, there are um, uh, use of hidden load balancing by a process that we and others have referred to as uh, diffusion. We've reversed, you can laugh, we've reversed the use of SRAM and DRAM. If I were to say that there's a cache, I would say it's in the DRAM. And we're not doing it for the speed that we need a conventional cache, we're dealing with it for the capacity. And the DRAM is not in a global namespace, it's the SRAM that makes up a global namespace. Everything turned upside down on its head. And when you do that, it comes out beautifully. I'm sorry, there is an aesthetics to all of this. Uh, it shouldn't be the driving issue, but it does provide uh, pleasure in those late nights of design. This also requires a novel instruction set, a novel instruction set to support the very different um, uh, uh, execution model, uh, which we call uh, parallax in here, and I've already mentioned. Uh, and uh, to allow a, um, uh, the support of runtime systems for their highest efficiency, which is not usually a normal part. Runtime systems are, uh, when they are used, are used uh, almost with, uh, primarily as um, uh, software implemented. Um, but also finally, that the new, uh, new, gosh, it's very, very old class of data types, of data objects, are graphs, and not just static graphs, not just um, uh, regular graphs. And you'll find that in the uh, 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 Graph 500 uh, benchmark, uh, credit to Richard Murphy and many others who worked with him in the development of the Graph 500 benchmark, by the way, uh, and uh, the Fugaku machine uh, with Satoshi uh, is uh, the number one machine in that regard, uh, but um, dynamic graphs. Graphs that are constantly changing, and they're changing while they're spread over, I'm supposed to show a sense of spread here, spread over a, a very large distributed uh, system. And so making graph operations very efficient, as opposed to merely interpreting them software-wise, is, uh, is very important and why the instruction set must be highly innovative. And there is one last secret sauce in all this. If you do this, you find another source of parallelism. The metadata, the information in the graph structure that tells you what the topology of the graph is, actually allows real-time discovery through that of parallelism. And the parallelism gives you concurrency, which gives you more operations per second, which gives you reduction of time to solution. That's pretty special. That's exciting. If you look at the uh, standard of uh, Brett's first search uh, algorithm, which is classic and very, very typical, you'll find uh, one of two things. Uh, a, there is uh, large global barriers in there, which is over constraining. Uh, what I like to say about global barriers is it guarantees that the progress in the execution of the computation will be at the rate of the slowest um, uh, passing threads of the computation. Uh, and um, uh, that, so the global barriers are a problem. Uh, and uh, it uh, does not allow, uh, so, uh, and the most efficient way to do that is using uh, sparse linear algebra, very clever work done by a number of people, some of them uh, at uh, Lincoln Laboratories in Massachusetts, but all over the world. Uh, and um, uh, this uh, uh, is really not good when pieces of uh, such a graph evolves. And then yes, let me just give credit to FPGAs uh, wow, you know, 
when I was young, I got to build things out of SSI and MSI parts. And that was, that was very cool, but that was also down around five megahertz clock rates. Uh, today, FPGA allows us, any of us, students and old aging professors, uh, to, to actually implement logic uh, in, in vast numbers on chips. And, and in fact, uh, I and my team are doing so uh, uh, currently uh, and getting ready to release a first prototype of our active memory architecture uh, using them. Now, um, in the last few minutes, last five minutes, uh, let me just uh, say a couple of things. If I had uh, questions, one of them would probably be, how do you program an active memory architecture in order to achieve scalability while in particular uh, also uh, exposing or delivering both use of productivity and performance portability? And uh, the answer is, well, yes. Uh, in the short term, we're doing nothing terribly original, although the details are very original. And that is that we are uh, exporting uh, a set of uh, language pragmas or directives to conventional bindings uh, of conventional languages. Most of our work is in C. Uh, some of it uh, extends to C++. And our near-term work is, in fact, using, at least to the workflow manager, Python to use the same sort of functionality, as well as providing some additional software tools that uh, essentially uh, are equivalent to a software development kit. All of these are in not just current development, but in a more simple form, are all operating now and even on our hardware prototype. But that's not where we want to go. It can't be where we want to go because uh, it's still, if as simple as today's programming is, that's far too hard. What we want to do is deliver a new uh, application programming interface, a new uh, abstraction, power of abstraction, to the user that uh, eliminates uh, the user's burden, the programmer's burden in any level of management of the hardware resources. This is really big. Now, a lot of uh, very, very good application program will you know, yell and scream at this point. I understand they have had careers where they had to do this in order to get effective computation, but it is painful. No one will deny that it's much more costly to develop the software than it is the hardware. There's a reason for that. The hardware sucks. The software, uh, needs to have a better, more uniform, a flat archy that disassociates the user's semantics, including a parallelism, from the physical machine's uh, structures, including parallelism. And uh, the third major thing is that the programming methodology not just acknowledges, but exploits the availability of runtime system functionality. Because runtime system functionality, again, uh, largely removes the need or the imposition on the programmer for doing hardware management. It takes on that burden and in fact finds opportunities that neither the programmer nor the compiler could uh, identify and, and um, uh, determine, delineate, uh, uh, prior to uh, application load. I've already talked about the runtime system. Uh, this is, um, uh, you know, making sure that somebody doesn't claim that I didn't give them enough credit. Uh, their uh, runtime systems exist for a long time and for a multiplicity of purposes. Uh, when I was a graduate student and I used Lisp, uh, as well as the following 10 years, uh, there was a deep runtime system there. Even today, those of you who use Java or a few of you who use Silk, runtime systems are needed for, among other reasons, garbage collection. Uh, there, uh, in the last decade, there was um, a substantial amount of work, including our own HPX work, uh, in, in uh, runtime systems for high performance computing. Most of them have gone away. My HPX5 project has, I'm pleased that my colleagues at LSU and a broad community uh, internationally uh, continue to advance HPX, mostly in the context of C++. The venerable Charm++, University of Illinois, uh, was one of the earliest uh, used scientific computing libraries and uh, continues uh, to this day. And Legion of Stanford 
uh, which uh, has been used uh, also in, in, the, uh, in NVIDIA uh, are being used. But here we need an improved runtime system, a different class of runtime system. And I'll just give one distinguishing characteristic. These new runtime systems have to emphasize, as I said before, not the ALU utilization, not the floating point unit uh, uh, utilization, but rather the memory latency and bandwidth optimization. And so really it's different. All the others worry about ALUs. And my final slide, I hope that's my final slide. Okay, my penultimate slide is that the application of the future is artificial intelligence. The term artificial intelligence has been around, excuse me, I'm slipping out of my chair, uh, has been around since late 1950s. Uh, even around 1950, you will see, and by the way, well worth reading, uh, the work of Alan Turing and John von Neumann. If you go back to the first half of the 19th century, working with Charles Babbage, was uh, Ada Lovelace, the uh, daughter of uh, Lord Byron, uh, who is by some considered the first computer scientist. And she did consider the possibility of a machine that could actually think. So not a new idea. The, all the rage, uh, uh, let's see, I, I should have, I said, yeah, Alan Turing and John von Neumann. Uh, you will see uh, Turing, who solved the last Hilbert problem, uh, um, uh, you know, is, is credited with the idea of uh, the Turing machine as a abstraction uh, to solve the uh, computability problem. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the halting problem. Uh, and uh, uh, von Neumann, of course, credited with the von Neumann architecture. At this time, you're, unless you've been living under a rock, uh, you uh, are uh, persuaded by the importance and the explosion of work in machine learning very important. I'm more comfortable with the term data science, uh, which is uh, in some way um, declarative rather than imperative. We don't create the architecture to do the, uh, do the work. We create the uh, algorithm to find what that algorithm uh, should be. So it's a meta algorithm. Um, but uh, at least uh, uh, supervised machine learning, I'm very uncomfortable referring to it as artificial intelligence. Again, people will yell and scream. I told you it's provocative. Um, that doesn't mean it's not useful. It is very useful. But there's something being hidden. Artificial intelligence, even in its historical sense, was much greater than um, uh, what supervised machine learning is. There's a little bit more that I credit unsupervised machine learning. But that, of course, is for another discussion. What I'd like to bring to your attention is a forward-looking notion of machine intelligence. Well, you say people have used the term before, I I'll give you that. Um, but um, uh, I don't like the word artificial intelligence partly because it's ambiguous and partly because its history carries too much baggage of failures and rather well-intended naivete. Uh, I believe that there needs to be a clean sheet white paper to think about intelligence not as, uh, 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 in some sense, brain-inspired or modeling brain functions or duplicating, replicating how the human brain works. Intelligence is an abstraction, power of abstraction, in its own right. There didn't have to be people to invent, or um, there didn't need to be people for the existence of the abstraction of intelligence. And so a machine intelligence is something to look forward to. It's, it's not data. It's enabled, but it is not graphs. It is not um, uh, information in the Shannon-esque sense, the bit, uh, although entropy is important. Uh, and um, it, um, uh, it is what we might refer to as knowledge, whatever that is. Uh, I, I'm, I sound like I'm doing hand-waving. There's much more than hand-waving here. But here's the bottom line. Machine intelligence is about machine understanding. Show me a machine that you think understands. First of all, I will, will probably uh, be very skeptical. But um, uh, that is on a completely different level than today's artificial intelligence and certainly today's uh, machine learning. We're working on a model uh, called CRIS, 
cognitive real-time interactive system, which if successful would provide uh, the framework, the, the scaffolding for a system that uh, understands in real time. By the way, credit to Winograd, who may be among the first to ever attempt such a thing with the, the now famous blocks program. Last slide. So I will do the first bullet and I'll let you read the second major bullet. What will be different 10 years from now? In 2030, the architecture will be non von Neumann. The compute cells will be very fine grained. Uh, and by the way, you know, a lot of that is happening now. So it's not like I'm being brilliant here. It will be a new execution model, not a heterogeneous broken up falling apart model with, uh, uh, what do I call it, duct tape programming, where you're using three different layers of programming at the same time, uh, just to get down to the hardware. There'll be a return of uh, globality in identifying objects. It'll be a global namespace, not just a virtual memory space, which is still pages of vectors of bytes, but a namespace, which is abstraction in its own right, down to the lowest uh, level of operation. It will be guided by an internalized runtime system intervention between the user and the hardware. It'll expose a single system image. You, the, the user won't see uh, the, the scaling, the topology, uh, the number of elements, the semantics of the programs will be the same. The programs will continue as a native data type graphs and that's time varying irregular graphs. And in fact, the, that parallelism will be discovered at real time, not have to be discovered uh, by the compiler or the programmer. Go ahead and read the other bullets at your leisure. This, these are a set of milestones that uh, are probably incomplete, but uh, uh, need, uh, need to be performed well prior to 2030. I'd like to say, uh, as I was discussing with Werner and Happy, um, in this week, this time frame, uh, the U.S. federal government has announced a new research program, a three-year program, that is relevant to all of the points I brought up. That doesn't mean that this is the right answer, but it does mean that what we just talked about addresses the primary requirements of this new research program. It is not incremental. That program is sponsoring and driving revolution. So I promised you a picture. Here it is. Uh, one picture. This is the first uh, prototype of the um, uh, active memory architecture. Uh, this one isn't even, this is the custom PC board. We designed it ourselves. It holds 16 FPGAs. Uh, at the time of this photograph, there are only four. We were still debugging the board at that time, but it's sort of our baby picture. Uh, there are four FPGAs, each of them holding these uh, multiple compute cells uh, that do this uh, execution. And there is a fifth FPGA there that manages, controls, uh, the communication, the overall synchronization, and the interface to uh, a host system. We're very excited about this. I hope that some year, if I'm invited back to CHPC uh, to talk to you again, that I can show you the working system and show you numbers that demonstrate the uh, uh, validity of this non von Neumann uh, 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 strategy. Uh, and set of concepts. Thank you all very much. Sorry, I ran a few minutes over, uh, but I did want to complete the thoughts. Uh, thank you all very much. Happy, thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, this is a very exciting talk. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, you will recognize is that, as I said, initially I did not have my tie on, but I think I had to honor this uh, talk. Uh, and I notice uh, it's red. I notice it's red. So we're in good Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And um, it reminds me that uh, great stories uh, in uh, the African tradition, um, always we had to make fire. And, and this took me uh, <laughs> to the time when we were like um, 2014, if you recall, when we had our uh, dinner in the Kruger National Park with the rangers around to make sure that we can enjoy our dinner. 
and I see you doing this talk again. Fortunately, um, everything permitting, we are going to have um, our next conference in the Kruger. And I think this talk, we will have to do it at the bushfire again. <laughs> um, and, and thank you so much for taking us through and inviting us in your journey um, and, 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 and through this. I think what was very important is to help us understand and, and moving through with your journey, how things moved and to be able to understand why things are where they are. And, 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 and thank you very much for, for, for giving us this. Thank, well, thank um, you, Happy. Uh, uh, may I just say, and to your audience, that CHPC and you and your colleagues have been part of that journey. And I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate uh, the platform that you have provided, uh, the forum uh, that it greatly expands the international community uh, to whom I have the opportunity to speak. So um, uh, you are uh, a chapter in that book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. There are some comments and questions uh, we will be sending you and uh, you can respond to the colleagues, but um, uh, that is an appreciation of, uh, of, uh, of the talk. So we will be sending you these questions. So we have to start moving for the other colleagues who will be coming to this room. You of know, in the, in the physical fashion, uh, we always have to move away from the students who are running to come to their awards and uh, avoiding them knocking us down. So they are now virtually going to knock us down from this platform. So, <laughs> so yeah, I hope you will be joining us, Thomas, uh, in um, the student awards. So we will be going over there and colleagues who are joining us uh, here online, you can just stay on this platform. Uh, because the awards will be happening immediately on this platform in about four minutes time. Thank you very much, Thomas, and thank you colleagues for listening and uh, staying for the talk. And see you in about four minutes with uh, the other team who will be giving us the awards. Thank, thank you, you very much, Happy.